Once again, good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to join us. You've tuned into the right place and we'll start our program in just a moment. So good evening and welcome everyone to this town hall conversation about how science can form the basis of good public policy about children's mental health. I'm Tim Ritchie, the president of the Museum of Science, and it's our pleasure to partner again with GBH to bring this discussion to our nation, our community, and our world. For too long, mental health in general and children's health in particular has been an afterthought in our society. For too long, mental health challenges have been treated as personal failures rather than as treatable conditions. As a result, we are poorer, harsher, and less productive than we could be. Policy based on sound science can change this, and I'm glad you've joined us for this discussion about how. And now I'd like to turn this conversation over to our host, Joe Matthew, anchor and executive editor of GBH's Morning Edition. Thank you, Tim. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and with everyone this evening. And what an honor for us at GBH News to be part of this partnership with the Museum of Science. Like all of you, I have that memory of when I first went to the Museum of Science as a kid when my dad brought me there. I'll never forget sitting in the Apollo 11 space capsule. and It may as well have been the real thing. And so we spent a lot of time talking about the things that are important to us and learning a lot at the Museum of Science. And we're gonna to try to do both tonight with a really excellent panel that we've put together here on this forum. This is the third time since March that GBH and the Museum of Science are convening as an expert panel here to look at how the pandemic specifically is impacting our health and well-being. In March, if you were with us, we looked at the arrival of COVID-19 and how little we understood about it. At the time in June, we came together to look at hunger one of the first ways in which the crisis caused a spike as many lost their jobs. And we talked about how to deliver basic health care to the most vulnerable. Today, we're turning to our kids and how they're managing the stress of virtual learning and a lack of normal social connection. This is personal for a lot of us here in this forum as we talk specifically about their mental health and how to help them. And we have a couple of important uh, thinkers on this topic today who will make up our panel, beginning with Representative Marjorie Decker, who has represented parts of Cambridge in the Massachusetts State Legislature since 2013 and 2019. She became chair of the Mental Health, Substance Abuse, and Recovery Joint Committee. Dr. Matthew Birmingham is the Medical Director of Children's Services of Roxbury and a consultant to the Department of the Mental Health and Early Childhood Mental Health. He also established the Metro West Center for Wellbeing in Millis, Mass. And Dr. Philip Wong, is Chief of Psychiatry at Cambridge Health Alliance, where he oversees clinical practices, training and research, and has served as Director of Research for the American Psychiatric Association as Deputy Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, the NIMH, which you'll hear us refer to a couple of times, if not frequently, throughout the evening. First of all, thank you, all three of you, for being with us and making this possible to have this conversation tonight. It's great to see all of you, even here on Zoom. <clears throat> I know that uh, for all of us, in some cases, we're getting used to this. In other cases, you might live on Zoom every day, but a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, as attendees, your cameras and audio are muted. So if you wanna shout at us, we actually will not hear you. And this program is being recorded as you might notice at the top of your screen, it'll be available on the Forum Network website afterward. And we're streaming live right now on Facebook. So we're gonna talk for about 30 minutes and get through a couple of pretty important issues here, talk about some of the science behind this and talk about the effort to solve some of these, address some of these issues here. 
in Massachusetts. And if you have a question during the event, use the Q&A box at the bottom. Just wave your mouse over it if you don't see it right away. You'll see Q&A uh, where our producers are monitoring uh, that feed and we'll get questions uh, to us to share with our panelists. So we will not have a chat feature for uh, you to use in this talk to be clear, but there will be an opportunity for us to share links to you on your end and we'll do that as uh, we make our way through the evening. And as you can see to the right here, that actually has already begun. So uh, let's get to it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And I think it's important to set the baseline to kind of talk about where we were before COVID, uh, where our children mental health needs were and what the challenges were at the time. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Wong. If, if you could describe doctor where we were before the coronavirus appeared, if you can even think back that far, um, with the data that you have gathered and the work you've done with the NIMH, uh, you can maybe help to set the table for this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And, and let me just also thank my, uh, thank the organizers and also my co-panelists for allowing me to participate in this important uh, discussion. Um, I think there's a slide and if we could put that up. Um, this basically just gives you a sense of uh, what the unmet needs uh, for mental health care in youth were uh, prior to, to COVID uh, in the US. And, and they're really marked by slow detection and late intervention. Uh, as you can see, um, mental disorders are, are quite common in our youth. One in five experience one uh, and experience what's called a serious mental illness. These are the most serious and impairing forms of mental illness. And 11% uh, uh, will experience a mood disorder, 10% a behavioral, uh, or conduct disorder, 8% uh, an anxiety disorder. And the impact of these is quite severe, as you can see in the lower panels. Uh, suicide is the third leading cause of, of death in our youth. And over 90% of those who die by suicide have an underlying mental disorder. Um, meanwhile, uh, what you can see on the right-hand side in the lower panel is that um, mental disorders and, and, and addictions are unique in that they are largely disorders of the young with nearly 50% of those who uh, are going to experience one of these disorders having it occur uh, before uh, age 14. Nearly three quarters uh, experience the onset of these disorders before age 24. Um, despite this very early age of onset, as you can see, there's nearly a 10 year delay before the onset of a disorder and actually getting any form of care. And um, in that time, there can be a, a lot of negative consequences. As you can see, almost a third of our youth with mental disorders uh, drop out of school. And that obviously can impact not just their educational attainment, but, but then their uh, employment outcomes as well. And as you can see, um, over 70% of youth in juvenile justice uh, experience a mental disorder. Um, when, despite these delays, even when youth do uh, actually get mental health care, uh, like, like adults, um, very few actually uh, get effective care. And it follows what we at NIMH used to call the rule of halves. So of the 60 million Americans who experience a mental disorder in a given year, fewer than half actually get anything, any form of, of care. Of those who get any form of care, only about half get anything that you would consider to be minimally adequate, possibly effective. And then of those who, it's, who do get what we call minimally uh, adequate care, fewer than half actually respond and, and see an improvement in their uh, symptoms and functioning. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about mental health care in this country for our youth is um, it's marked by disparities. Uh, what we observed in, in, in much of this data is that uh, African Americans are only, African Americans and Hispanics are only about half as likely as white Americans to receive mental health care. And Asian Americans are only about one third as likely. So, and, and this is of, of relevance to us here at CHA, uh, Cambridge Health Alliance, because the populations we serve in, in Boston Metro North, uh, over two thirds identify as being non-white. Well, those are some big numbers, uh, Doctor. I was going to follow up uh, by asking you what what kind of a job we were doing, how well we we're doing managing this before COVID, and it sounds like not well. Uh, Doctor Birmingham, I wonder if you can describe 
the addition, you add the layer of COVID, the, the stress and the trauma uh, that's brought to children who were clearly already at a deficit. This is especially true for children of color. If the rate of suicide in general population for kids 10 to 19 is the third leading cause of death, in 2019, we found that among kids of color, it's become the second leading cause of death. And when I, um, when I speak to primary care doctors and other health professionals, I would remind them that if there was something that was killing like one of the top killers of your youth, wouldn't you want to pay attention to it? And I think often we forget the brain as part of the body and we ignore what happens there and how it affects our overall well-being. And so the stress of, of this current um, crisis that we're going through is such that we don't really know the full extent of how it will impact us, but we have some ideas based on past experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess what we'll talk today about is what we can do to help enhance our capacity to cope or be resilient. We absolutely will. I, I wonder, uh, just with that said, if you can, if you can answer, if it's possible, uh, the extent to which age factors into this. We talk about kids and, and that, that could be anything from five years old to what, a late teenager. I'm not sure where we're cutting that off. I, I saw it in, in preparing for this conversation uh, that might be up to uh, 24 years old. Uh, to what extent does age factor into what we're talking about before we widen this conversation? That's an excellent question, Joe. I think it affects all of us differently, but it affects each of us based on our stage of development. And so for young children, um, I, I tell the story of my grandchildren who when we were first going through this and either myself or my wife wanted to give them a hug and they were like, you can't touch me. So what they knew is that those that loved them couldn't touch them. Um, and then as I I worked with kids that were more in the middle age between eight, nine, 10 to 15, 16. I started noticing changes in their sleep patterns. And then initially with the crisis, many of them would stay up till four, five, six o'clock in the morning. Um, and then for the adolescent who's, who's one of the main function of adolescence is developing a sense of self based on your relationship to your peers, being the the capacity to have that relationship was profoundly discouraging to many of them. Um, and they really felt lost. And for the older young people who are trying to figure out how will they get launched, everything was frozen. So they were confused. We worked so hard to get to this point, to get to graduation, to start college. And now the whole world is on pause. And what do we do? How do, how do we deal with the fact that we've done all that we should do to get to this point and now there's no place really to go so i think it depends on the stage of life that they're in it's mm -hmm. a great answer uh, uh representative decker uh you and i have something in common if not others on this panel and that i have a 13 year old here who is staying up half the night and has not seen anything close to normal in terms of structure uh, that we knew about before March. You would know what it's like to have kids learning from home. And so you're kind of wearing two hats here uh, this evening as, as we'll end up talking about maybe a legislative approach to this, but you're seeing firsthand uh, the added layer of stress when you add remote learning on top of everything else we just said. How's it going? Um, well, you know, we're only a couple of days into this year, and I, I would say that my concerns that were true as a parent in the spring, unfortunately, continue to be true um, now in the fall. And I think some of that is that, you know, children, you know, I, I have a fourth and a sixth grader, and as you know, children need to be together. <laughs> they need to be together, together for so many reasons. They need to be around other adults that are not their parents to help also regulate and to also like just be a little bit more objective about their feelings. And um, I really worry about the isolation and the impact of, of not having that connectedness. And I, I can tell you, Joe, that for me, when I look at my children and I truly have seen them suffer through this, and I know that they have everything that we can possibly offer them in terms of security, food, um, that they don't have to worry about going without basic human needs and they're still suffering. And so I immediately jump to, children whose parents continue to have to work 
or who are also struggling with their own emotional needs or maybe have just lost their job so they have new additional needs that they're also going through. And, and that is really where my heart aches. And I can tell you as a legislator in this committee, we were falling short, far short um, prior to the pandemic in being able to meet the needs of children from the, the little ones that you talk about all the way through high school and, and older. And, um, and now the pandemic has hit and we are seeing that that gap is even greater. And that's after uh, a couple of pretty major pieces of legislation that addressed health care and mental health care on Beacon Hill. So I'd like to ask you a little bit later on in the hour about some of the gaps that, that maybe could be filled. Dr. Wong, you have talked about the social determinants of health. Uh, more specifically, when we, when we describe the conditions in which people are, are not only uh, born into, but what they live through as young people, uh, that creates a wide spectrum uh, of, of variances here as, as you're studying this issue. Yeah, yeah, and, and let me just uh, demystify what, what that term means, social determinants of health. It's basically what Representative Decker and, and Dr. Birmingham were talking about. Mm -hmm. Social determinants of health are basically the, the so social conditions that you grow up with and, and live with. Uh, these are, this includes your environment, your exposures, your experiences, things like poverty, food and housing insecurity that, that Representative Decker just talked about, violence and trauma that Dr. Birmingham uh, talked about. What, what science and research has been showing is that the social determinants of health play a really important role in determining how well you do in terms of your health outcomes. And not just your mental health outcomes, but your general medical outcomes as well. Uh, the other thing that science is learning is that, that uh, social determinants of health also underlie uh, our healthcare disparities. Uh, and as you can imagine, communities of color experience greater illness burdens, both because of their worse social determinants of health, and then the subsequent increase in things like chronic medical conditions, like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, and then this, it also leads to greater behavioral health conditions. Uh, things like we just talked about, serious mental illness, uh, substance use, uh, uh, and um, despite these greater illness burdens, uh, communities of color um, have worse access to high quality care and therefore uh, and, and experience worse health outcomes. Um, what, what I'll say is on the, on the basis of COVID, um, it is uh, likely to exacerbate all of the above as, as, as was said, uh, in part because these uh, economic downturn that that has uh, subsequently followed uh, on, on the heels of, of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, as well as the further deterioration in social conditions will exacerbate all of these conditions. Hmm. Yeah, the, the uh, addition of maybe uh, mom or dad lost their job is another element of stress uh, that we can talk about. And, and Dr. Birmingham, you're seeing more and more college students who are facing uh, this. We talk about remote learning and you think about that image of, you know, a seven or eight year old sitting at the kitchen table staring at Zoom. But there are there are adults who are college students showing up in cities like Boston who are not sure whether they're moving into a motel, a, a hotel, I should say, or a campus dorm, if they're safe. They're seeing uh, people partying around them. They're seeing in some cases being uh, students being suspended there must be many layers uh, here when you meet with students. Try to unmute yourself too before you get too far in your answer. Thank you. Do thank you for that. Dr. Wang just talked about the social determinants of health. There was a really interesting commentary in, in JAMA uh, just a few, um, just recently, and it was entitled The Moral Determinants of Health. And he talked about what Immanuel Kant mentioned, which is the moral law within. And a really interesting quote is written by um, Dr. Donald um, Berwick. When the fabric of communities upon which health depends are torn, then healers are called upon to mend it. And the moral law within it insists that we do so. I think this is such a powerful and really unusual event that it we don't even have all of the social determinants yet. So what do we do and how, how, how do we adjust to it? What I'm seeing with older young people is that some of 
some of them understand that the sacrifices that they're doing is for the betterment of the whole. But a lot of young people don't get that notion. Mm. What they're experiencing is the loss and not the sacrifice. So one of the things I try to remind them constantly is how much I appreciate the sacrifice that they're giving to protect us because they probably won't be the ones most directly affected physically by this. There will be a subset that will be, but it's the parent, the grandparents and the healthcare professionals who will have to deal with the virus when it spreads beyond the confines of where most young people congregate. And so it's, it's really been sad. I've had some young people go to college and in the first week of being there, they caught the virus already. Oh boy. And then they said, well, most of my friends also caught it. Now they didn't have it as bad, but then the impact of being in an environment where everyone is concerned about the spread of the virus has meant that they're isolated and they're, they're, um, they're withdrawn. So that first experience of college is not what it used to be. And so I, one young lady uh, just last week um, called me and said, I'm taking a one-way ticket I bought a one-way ticket back to Massachusetts. <laughs> um, she's going to con continue to do homeschool or schooling at home. I've had some young people postpone and take a gap year because why do I need to go to school if I can't guarantee that some of my peers will also respect the recommendations of being safe, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're young, like you said, but it takes about 24 to 25 years of brain development to really get to understand the consequences of our action in such a way that it changes our behavior. And so young people may intellectually understand what they need to do, but the ability to implement it doesn't often really fully kicking until then. And so they're affecting, they're affected by this in a way that they experience what they're losing. And I think one of the things we can do is to help them appreciate that what they're giving up is a sacrifice, but we appreciate that sacrifice. And we'll talk more about that because the more we can see what we do is something for the whole and for each other to support each other, it makes the struggle a little more endurable. I don't know if it's possible to, uh, to bring up our, our first poll question, uh, but we actually had one that was geared toward this when we consider what it is uh, that is adding the most pressure. And, and, and Representative Decker, I wonder, based on just what you're seeing in your own home and what you're hearing anecdotally, it's, it's isolation, clearly. Uh, it's also uncertainty. And if you look at the poll here, what aspects we're asking of your children living through this pandemic concerns you the most at this time? This is for everyone who is with us here as part of the forum. Uh, and we'll let you know the results as we get uh, uh, a little bit further in. But I, I'm not sure if you can separate the two, Representative. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, Dr. Birmingham talks about the impact of, um, of this on, you know, young people to the age of 24. I think one thing that's really important to note, um, and, and I'm going to take note about the appreciation part and try to do more of that myself in terms of messaging as a public official. Um, but I also think that it's really important to understand our children, we are all experiencing a crisis, right? We're all in this crisis. We're all experiencing it. We're not experiencing it equally. And young people, while I think there's this kind of this adage like children are resilient and you know we're all stressed out, it's really important to note that children's brains are still developing. So the longer they experience stress and the longer they go without us actually acknowledging that that actually has an impact and, and can impact their brain development in ways that are not healthy. And I think this is where you know public policy comes in. I think about how many kids are stuck in our emergency departments. They were stuck there because there was no bed for them in a community-based um, setting that could provide them the appropriate support that they needed before COVID. We saw a dip in people not going to the ED, but we've seen that climb right back up. And so you still have a lot of young people who are stuck there. You have a lot of congregate care homes that are not providing the same level of care that they once could because they also won funding Although the state, I will say, has done a good job at getting funding out to a number of these programs, but a lot of places still have to actually provide space for isolation. We found that the um, units that the mobile units that will go to young people often these crisis mobile units, the number of calls have gone down by 47%. Um, 
you know, DCF is not seeing a rise in calls from the families that they're traditionally in touch with, which is problematic, but they, they are seeing a rise in calls from families who are experiencing relapse. And, and so I will just say that the traditional path of getting services to children was already very complicated based on how we fund um, health insurance and mental health services to children, but schools played a really important role. We no longer have the majority of our children going to school. And so the question before us that I keep pushing is can children thrive with the current model which puts most children behind a screen 100%? The answer is no. What will be the ongoing impact that we have to keep reassessing? And how do we expand resources for educators, staff, and parents who now need help, more help in recognizing what are the concerns? Um, what are the mental health concerns? What are the behavioral health concerns that they should pay attention to? And how are we, through the state, going to create more paths to provide those services, which were already not enough prior to the COVID? But there is a tsunami building and the crisis that we are experiencing. If our children suffer and they die because of suicide or they experience depression that goes untreated, that is just as awful as actually having COVID, dying of COVID, or the impact, the long-term impacts of COVID. They are equal. And so I believe that we do need to be on steroids with providing additional resources and quickly rolling out additional support services for how we're going to address behavioral health needs of children. Interesting to see these numbers uh, come in, and I suppose we shouldn't be too surprised uh, with isolation uh, being the top at the moment with 66% followed by their socialization at 59 and their development at 53. And of course, we're hearing clearly that these are all intertwined. Uh, I'd like to ask both of our doctors about past experience, but we don't really have data uh, on this gentleman. We're kind of building the plane in flight here. Uh, Dr. Wong, you've looked at data from Hurricane Katrina as uh, obviously we're dealing with unique circumstances, but when you look at recovery from other tragedies, uh, the failure to get to people on time. What did we learn? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, you're absolutely right. There is no blueprint for how to respond. And so we've had to uh, rely on, on, on past studies of disasters. And one that I uh, had the privilege of being part of as a researcher when I was at uh, Harvard Medical School uh, was a study of the impact of, of, of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I, I think I... I Forward the slide that that hopefully yes. shows some some of those results, uh, which I think are instructive. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and I, it's worth pointing out that um, the uh, populations in New Orleans and uh, the Gulf Coast and the conditions in those areas are very much again like uh, uh, the populations and the conditions in uh, uh, Boston Metro North um, that that we serve. Um, so what you can see is, uh, again, about, um, in, in this case, um, there were about one-fifth one -fifth of the population had a pre-existing uh, mental disorder, again, like the rest of the nation. Um, but what is interesting is that uh, afterwards, because of the destruction in infrastructure and, and, and just uh, all kinds of other um, disruptions, only uh, about half of people with pre-existing mental disorders continue to receive uh, 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 mental health treatment. What was somewhat more surprising to us, and you can see this on the uh, right-hand side, is that those um, uh, 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 people who had no pre-existing condition uh, about uh, upwards of, of even a third, at least among the New Orleans uh, respondents, developed new de novo mental disorders, again, because of the deterioration in, in uh, social conditions. Um, and of them, uh, the vast majority received no mental health care, as you can see. Um, now, the reasons for uh, this, this this decrease or lack of treatment are, are instructive, and that's shown at the bottom of this, this slide. Among those with pre-existing conditions who fail to receive continued treatment because of, uh, of Hurricane Katrina, the most um, uh, 
cited were lack of enabling factors. Now these are again, uh, social conditions. And what it says is it points out that it's gonna be very important for us to monitor uh, and, and also address uh, people's social determinants of health uh, throughout this crisis. Um, on the right-hand side, what you can see is um, one of the, the, the major reason why people who develop new de novo mental disorders, the major reason why they didn't uh, um, seek any care were largely attitudinal barriers that even though they had severe symptoms, you know, serious uh, declines in functioning, they felt they didn't need anything or, or they expressed uh, stigma about receiving mental health care. So what it says is in this uh, current disaster, we're gonna have to pay attention to doing outreach and also uh, pay attention to uh, developing prevention uh, that hopefully averts people from developing mental disorders in the first place. Boy, clearly there's an enormous amount that we have to be concerned about and just still a lot that we don't know, uh, Dr. Birmingham, but you know what it's like to go into a very uncertain situation as you experienced uh, following the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, I was really taken by, uh, by your experience there. In 2010, you founded a clinic to respond uh, to this disaster. And I'm sure that you have learned a lot about helping communities without knowing exactly what you're dealing with in that given moment. Uh, we can add a lot of layers, uh, by the way, when you turn on the TV, go on Twitter or TikTok, see people protesting in the streets, you see political rancor that uh, is becoming a pastime for half the country, if we could just mix in a couple of other elements. Absolutely. So thank you for that question. Um, and thank you for summarizing what you did, Dr. Wang. I think what we do is we try to extrapolate from what we know to what we don't know. And we have some understanding, we're still in the early phases of really understanding this, of what to do with maybe a major disaster that happens at one time or over maybe a span of a few days. We're not very good at how to understand or even how to think about responding to a prolonged stressful event that goes on not just for a few days, but weeks to months. And so one of the things that we learned, um, and so myself and another psychologist, Amima uh, St. Louis, we, we got together with a group of other uh, Haitian mental health providers in the Boston, Massachusetts area, and we developed the Haitian Mental Health Network. And we were looking at evidence-based responses for uh, traumatic, stressful events, like earthquake or um, natural disasters like tsunamis. And you know, we learned that the idea of just getting people to talk about what's going on is probably not very helpful to them in immediate, immediate moments following the event. What really is the most helpful, and um, thinkers like Robert Macy, who've worked on developing psychological first aid, what they find is helping people return to normal is one of the most therapeutic things you can do for them helping them find where their loved ones are, trying to maintain the routine that they once had to try to return to a state of homeostasis, of going back to what you used to know, and, and even though it's very hard to do so, is actually more therapeutic psychologically than telling me how you feel. There'll be time to talk about how you feel, but right now is how do I deal with what I need today? We were thinking about using uh, a, a treatment called uh, trauma-focused CBT to help people cope with trauma. But we learned that the other thing we learned is to respect the indigenous group of people's way of coping with stress. And Haitians have a way of coping with stress. They often do it in community. So they meet together, they sing, they dance, they meet in a circle. It's a very physical um, response, not just a psychological one. So they do physical activity. And so our work and the team's work was to how to integrate what we knew as evidence-based interventions with the culturally accepted ways of coping with stress. And I think that's what we need to think about for our young people and, and our community today. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things that you were asking earlier about how do you help different age children, the younger the child, the more they take the lead from us. So one of the best things we can do for our children is take care of ourselves because they will look to us to see how they should respond. 
And I was reminded actually re recently when my daughter was expecting to have class today and she didn't know what, what, what to expect. And the first few weeks of school, she's unsure about what's going to be done because the lecture is not when it was scheduled. There was a recording that nobody knew about. And I reminded her that the freeze response to stress and trauma is something that we all experience. And I was also aware that my, my wife and I, we didn't freeze. Um, for me, I was able to walk to my office every day and walk home. And I first started doing it gradually, but then I realized it was one of the things that helped me keep my mind sane. And it was a simple thing, but after a while, it became such a powerful therapeutic thing because I wasn't just freezing, I was engaging in, in a positive activity that was both helpful for my body, but also for my mind. And I was getting fresh air and I was having sunshine and had a regularity. And I really think that's important to exemplify for children, not just to tell them to go to sleep, but for us to demonstrate it as well, because they take their leads from us. Some things never change. If yeah. you're just joining us uh, here on the GBH forum uh, page on Facebook, or if you're uh, maybe a late entry here in our Zoom virtual studio, welcome. My name is Joe Matthew, and we're lucky to be joined by uh, a great panel this evening as we discuss child mental health, as we speak with Representative Marjorie Decker, Dr. Matthew Birmingham, and Dr. Philip Wong. Uh, we are going to have 10 or 15 minutes at the end of this hour for uh, our viewers, for our audience to ask uh, the three of you questions. So I wanna make sure that we allow time for that. Um, so I'd like to just advance if we can to the, uh, the solutions component, the response, what we can do uh, as we try to find some productive uh, components of the program here. Um, maybe we can see the final results of our poll as well uh, while we're setting this up a little bit here because everyone had a chance to weigh in, uh, not with great surprise, isolation at 71% with uh, our audience deciding what aspects of your children living through this pandemic concerns you the most at this time. Isolation, as you can see, followed by socialization and then their development. Um, I have to ask the representative very quickly because uh, you work in politics. Um, how do you shield your kids or how do you manage your kids reaction to hearing the president call names that they're not allowed to use uh, to seeing a real ugly debate break out in the streets, not just on cable news, but even in the case of what we saw in Portland a couple of weeks ago, people punching each other and fighting in the streets as if this is some kind of maniac movie. This is all happening at the same time. How do you talk to them about that? You know, I, I think we it's evolving in our house um, with political with people taking to the streets regarding racial injustice. My kids are watching that. They are feeling it deeply. They are thinking about their friends and the idea that they have friends who are treated differently and in fact that their lives are more at risk than theirs because of the color of their skin makes them, um, you know, I have one in particular who gets very angry over this. His, uh, the, the level of anger that he feels towards this president and as a parent, I have to manage that anger. I have to honor that anger. I, I affirm that anger. And then I have to take it back and say, but this is what democracy looks like. We are going to do something about this. And I remind him that there's a lot of adults and young people who are together working to both safely take to the streets. The first time I went out to some of the, um, the gatherings um, and he was scared. He was scared about what does it mean pe for people to come together outside of the house to, um, to, to mourn and to oppose um, state violence, right? Violence that the people are dying at the hands of, of police around uh, the country. And he was also, he was angry about that, but he was also afraid for my safety. <laughs> and he was afraid for everyone else's safety. So I will just say that these are complicated times for all of us as parents. And um, I, I think it becomes more important that what Dr. Birmingham and Dr. Wong are talking about is how do we then ensure that caregivers and educators have the opportunity to actually absorb this information themselves, that they have the tools to help support young people in those times. As a parent, I'm, I'm often picking up and calling the phone of friends of mine who also do this professionally and saying, I'm talking about it over here. 
boy, am I failing miserably over here and trying in the, in the practice of this. And so uh, going back to your point, Dr. Birmingham, I am right before we lost the great um, RBG, I made a commitment to start working out. And in her honor, I'm now adding weight training to that. <laughs> My kids and I've had that conversation. It's self-care. But I, I want to say that we have a lot of teachers who before COVID did not have the tools and did not have professionals that they could talk to. Most of our schools do not have mental health professionals in their schools and the ones that they do, do not have enough. And so the job of the legislature and of the governor is to say, are we giving our teachers and our caregivers the tools that they need to ensure that their children are healthy and safe? And I would say we weren't doing it enough before this, but during COVID, we still have to force ourselves. How can children thrive if most of their learning is done by themselves behind a screen for those who have support and then for the children who don't have that support? And I will say that the policy question has not been forced. We're trying to figure out how to keep teachers safe. We're trying to keep, keep, keep teachers, uh, students safe, grandparents safe, but we're not answering the question about their emotional and behavioral health because the answer is that they're not safe right now and the good news, and I know Dr. Birmingham can respond to this, is that um, it's not inevitable, right? So experiencing this harm does build resiliency, right? But it does so with the right support and tools. And so my job is a committee chair. And I also want to say a really special thank you to Speaker DeLeo, who this wasn't a priority for him in the last term. And we ended up taking on more bigger roles around addressing addiction. This term, when he appointed me to this committee, he talked about wanting to actually do more to address the, the behavioral health needs of children. And together, I am working with his office and we are talking about in the last few months of a session that normally would be over by now, what are the things that we can do to get more tools to students, to caregivers and to educators? And, and so I think that's where I am as a parent. Um, and um, and as, as a policymaker, these two are so entwined for me, but I'll tell you that first day, of independent learning where my nine-year-old was left by herself for almost two hours to be an independent learner on the first day, both in the break and independent learning, my heart just crushed. And then it crushed even more when I thought about how many kids are doing that her age and younger with no adults in the home. Well, based on the comments that we're seeing uh, from our audience, uh, some of which everyone can see, uh, a lot of people can relate with that. Let's get to let's get to the helping uh, part here. Let's let's try to solve a couple of issues, maybe answer some questions. Uh, and and I'd like to hear from both of our doctors, and I can use the the questions from our audience to maybe help us get to some of these ideas. Because I'd like to hear about, uh, in your case, Dr. Birmingham, what you're doing at at Children's Services of Roxbury, Dr. Wong at Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, one question very basic that caught my attention is how I can tell if my six-year-old, and I think you can insert any age here in, if, if you choose to answer it, uh, how can I tell if my six-year-old is doing okay or could use additional help? Let's talk about noticing signs, Dr. Wong. Well, yeah, I guess you're, you're getting at um, some of the things that we, we do need to do. Um, I think, um, you know, we here at, at Cambridge Health Alliance, you know, are trying to approach this um, in two ways. One is by developing new models of what we call patient-centered care. And what this involves is, uh, I'll give you an example. One is uh, developing uh, new models of what's called collaborative measurement-based care. Um, this is uh, collaborative because it usually involves a team, a team approach, uh, a primary care, a uh, physician, let's say, a behavioral health specialist, a, a care coordinator. And it's measurement-based because they, they actually screen and monitor these, these signs, these symptoms, how well a, 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 a kid is, is functioning. And they use those measurements over time to both guide the choice of treatment and then also adapt the treatment so that you change it in response to how, how the youth is responding. That's one. The second is, uh, it would be ideal, obviously, to prevent. And so we at CHA uh, have been uh, focusing on what's called population health. And this is not uh, traditional in healthcare where usually you wait for people to come you know, for formal care. Here, we're actually trying to get there earlier. 
and work in communities. And uh, in this case, uh, both detecting, you know, getting better at detecting and intervening earlier for those kids who have actually developed, uh, you know, formal uh, conditions, but then getting there even earlier, as, as Representative Decker was saying, uh, identify kids who are just starting to, to develop symptoms, maybe not full-blown disorders yet, and offering them resilience building. Uh, and there are a number of evidence-based uh, ways to do that. Uh, of course, this would have to take place earlier, maybe, maybe in schools. Uh, and so those are some things that we've been exploring. Um, the, the, uh, ultimately though, you know, we hope that through you know, optimally caring for, for youth who have disorders and ultimately getting better at preventing disorders, uh, that we, we hope we can offer uh, policymakers like Representative Decker uh, some help because we know there's a looming fiscal challenge uh, and, you know, Med Mass Health, the, the Commonwealth's uh, Medicaid and, and, and CHIP program, you know, already accounted uh, for 40% of total spa uh, state spending before COVID. And that's going to go up because of, of rising unemployment. And, and if we can get better outcomes and achieve, hopefully, savings, you know, in terms of health care, um, we're hoping that that gives some, uh, you know, policymakers the ability to not just address the uh, health needs and, and, and health equity uh, in our communities, but actually also uh, invest in other, as you're hearing, pressing social uh, um, uh, agendas and initiatives, uh, which we, you know, we, we live in a community and, and health needs are not the only uh, needs. Dr. Birmingham, you've talked a lot about uh, the signs of distress angry outbursts, uh, withdrawal, maybe, uh, maybe the child or the young adult is not talking at all. Uh, how about the matter of trust as well? The trust factor with medical professionals like yourselves that you have to break through. And one of our uh, audience questions is more specific, asking about the trust factor with medical concerns being treated, especially by people of color, those even more so with mental health, doctor. And one of the things that I find the most helpful, and I, I, I keep this on near me every day. My wife got me this when I first started uh, my practice. And it's a quote by D Jimi Hendrix. Um, Knowledge speaks, but wisdom um, listens. The way to get trust is to listen. If people know that you've listened to them and you've understood them, they're more likely to trust them than if you just tell them what you think they need to hear. And I think people were out in the streets because they didn't feel listened to, right? They were saying, we're hurting. No, 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 no. We're hurting. No, 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 no. Well, I'm hurting. No, everybody's hurting. Well, I'm hurting and everybody's hurting. And what's not being heard is that I'm, we're all hurting, right? But also I'm hurting today. And your neck is keeping me from breathing. I mean, your knee on my neck is keeping me from breathing, right? And I can't breathe. So can you just like at least move your knee so I can get a, a, a breath of air? You know, you don't have to necessarily love me, just can you let me breathe? Why is that so important? Well, because if, if I can trust you to at least give me the space to be a human being, then I may be able to engage in a dialogue with you. You know, one of the things I love about what you're doing, Marjorie, is you are a wonderful example of Abraham's Lincoln statement about a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Like, you live it, and you're remembering what it's like to be a parent, and you exemplify being concerned for the people. There is no great country or strong country without healthy children. You want a healthy country, you want to take care of the least member of your community, the kids. If your kids aren't healthy, your country isn't healthy. And if there is no social emotional health, there is no health. If we can get that and mind, wrap our minds around that, I mean, we, we realize that with the virus, we had what some have called a depression, right? So one of our greatest strengths as a country is our economic power. A little tiny virus caused havoc in markets. 
Without health, you don't have a healthy economy. You don't have a healthy country. So th that to me is an obvious thing. So it's wonderful that you're doing this because what you're doing is you're thinking about the Commonwealth. You're thinking about the community. You're thinking about the economy. You're thinking about what makes us strong by saying, we need to think about our kids. So how do you help kids? There's something I've come up with called the three R's. There's routine, um, relationship, and recreation. Routine, keep things consistent as much as you can for our, ourselves and our kids. Go to sleep at the regular time, try to get up at the regular time, even if class don't start at the regular time. Preferably get some early morning sunshine and get some exercise. That's one of the most fundamental basic aspects of, of, of helping us become healthy. I think we, we, we miss that so much. And then have something that you can look forward to. I think one of the scariest things that happened at the beginning of this is everyone was frozen and didn't know what to do. So there was a, a uh, our own, the fabric of our own structure of our life was rearranged, you know, we talked about that. Then about relationship, we know that social support, positive relationship is one of the most crucial factors of helping to build healthy resilience. And it's been very hard because we can't touch each other physically. So find a bubble where you have some people that you feel safe with and remain in touch. Don't isolate, reach out, connect. People fight sometimes when they get scared. We need our leaders to say, no, let's band together. I get the impulse to want to protect ourselves by looking after our own interests. We're not gonna make it that way. We need to make it together. And our leaders need to get that and to say that as much as they can. Some may be tempted to feel that they'll be reelected because they'll get people to be angry enough to vote. But what does it mean if the boat sinks? So your part of the boat is going to be dry and the other part is not going to be? The boat sinks, we all sink. And I think that's what the virus has taught us. The virus doesn't care what political party we belong, how much money we have. It affects all of us. And why some of us are more affected is because we were closer to where the virus gets people right? We, we had to go to work, some of us. We were already um, preconditioned to have pre-existing conditions, so it made us more susceptible to what the virus does. But what the virus did in New York, it eventually did in Florida, it did in Colorado, it did in, in California, it did in Wisconsin, right? It, it didn't say, oh, that's a state barrier, I'm not going to go there. So it affected the whole world. So how do we respond? We respond as humans, supporting each other, relationship, positive relationships. So that's, that's to me, the, 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 the solution. The practical way of doing that is taking time. I, and I, I'm, you know, I try to, my, you know, one of the reasons my wife got me this is I can speak for a long time, but what I find the most helpful is when I listen. And when I listen, people tend surprisingly to want to listen back. What a great answer, uh, doctor, thank you. Knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. I did not think that one of our doctors would be quoting Jimi Hendrix tonight, but I hope that you notice my Axis Bold as Love lunchbox and my Stratocaster behind me here in my home studio. Um, let's talk about then what you are doing, what the doctor is referring to, Representative. Uh, there was a question uh, from one of our audience members here about what long-term programs will be created in the Commonwealth to address disparity and to help our young people recover from the mental health effects of the pandemic. That's pretty much down the middle of what you're talking about. How do you get to it though, from a legislative standpoint? So I think there's a few things. Um, you know, we are coming out with a bill hopefully in the next week or so, and there'll be some things that will be immediate, right? How do we make sure that our educators and providers have immediate access to um, professionals who actually can quickly offer them some um, advice and, and practical experience about how to address or assess a mental health um, experience that a young person may be having. How do we ensure that those who are best to provide those services can more quickly connect with, with young people, right? And, and I say these things, but if you're a parent or an educator and you've had a child in your class who's experiencing a mental health crisis, you understand that what I'm saying um, can take six months to actually get support as a teacher, as a social worker, as a school, or as a parent. It can take sometimes longer. So some of the things that we're gonna do in this bill are about how to actually kind of shortcut some of that. Another issue here, so those of uh, my colleagues who know me and my staff who certainly know me, I'm not big on 
um, putting out reports that require um, task force. Because I think so often we ask people to come together and we take their incredibly valuable time and often it sits in a white paper with lots of good intentions. And then I will just say that legislators, we, um, we, juggle, we juggle a lot of things. And I think, you know, I, I'm quite certain I have undiagnosed ADD. And I think it also works really well for me to be able to bounce around to various topics. But that said, we want to make sure when we bring people together to, to actually focus on an issue, that those, um, those outcomes are going to mean something. So one of the things that we are bringing into this bill is we really need to do a better job in bringing the hospitals to the table, providers to the table, the Department of Education to the table. And we're talking the same table because and, and, and parents to the table. Right now, there's a lot of silos where the incredible work that Dr. Wong and Dr. Birmingham are talking about, often that is done outside of our either family units or outside of um, our school, school communities. And if they overlap, boy, the obstacles to actually connect those dots because of how we pay for our, our, our health care, and in particular, how we pay for our mental health care are really complicated. So in one school, you have to re you could have lots of different ways of addressing the same need for various kids, depending on their insurance. And, and so I will say all of this is understanding that we've also dramatically lost access to children. And um, again, I want to say that we are all experiencing this, but for children whose lang who's in language or their parents' language is not English, it's a second language, for children whose parents must leave the house and go to work, for children whose parents are experiencing their own trauma and the impact of this, we have to ask whose job is it to ensure that we are assessing, identifying, and providing support for children's behavioral health. And I will say the answer to that is, is way too choppy and it wasn't working to the best of our abilities prior to the COVID. And now we need to really come together and have a long-term conversation while we do some short-term addressing to get resources more quickly. And while the economy is really, we have one, we, we just lost, we were the highest unemployment in the country, our state. And I think we've now gone down a couple of notches, but it means that there's a lot of people out of work Revenue is really down. We're still looking at between five and $6 billion of lost revenue, which is better than what we thought. That is the silver lining there. Um, we hope it keeps climbing up, but we're going to have to spend money on increasing support services for children's behavioral health. Because if we don't spend it now, then we will spend it down the road and we will spend it in ways that are extremely cruel and unfair. As you see, the roots of so many people who are engaged in the, incar in, in the, in the carceral system, really, if we had addressed mental health support, poverty, the trauma of poverty, of violence, and I will just say that we're spending money in a budget and we need to make sure that we understand if we take a greater investment now, which might seem counterintuitive, we will be actually saving not only money in the long run, um, and building an economy, but more importantly, we will be saving and providing resiliency to children and families who will actually give back tenfold. Representative Decker, I appreciate it very much. Sorry, even I get muted sometimes here. Um, I think we have time for one last poll question. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm just so impressed by how many people are still with us here in our virtual studio because it's not often you get to hear from experts like this and some real voices of, uh, of passion like the representative. During this pandemic, what have you found time or made time for? It's a multiple choice. And as you can see, uh, most of these are pretty personal, like keeping me and my loved ones safe or meeting safely with friends or family like Dr. Birmingham was talking about. I'd love for maybe the three of you while we're waiting for the results to come in and everybody kind of has a chance to consider a lot of pretty important stuff that they heard uh, this evening. What we can do when we leave here, when we turn off the Zoom and we feel really good and smart about having this grown up conversation, what can we do when we walk out of the room here and we see our kids before bed? They're gonna have to get up tomorrow morning. They're gonna be back on the screen we've been talking about. They're gonna see something wacky on Twitter before we even talk to them. Dr. Wong, maybe something that we can take with us personally tonight. Yeah, I, I, I'll uh, harken back to what Dr. Birmingham said, uh, said and, and indeed he, he, it's because of his wisdom. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in, in disasters, uh, what has been found to work is, is trying your best to normalize, uh, you know, as much as you can. Now, obviously these are not normal times, 
but the extent to which we can, it, it's been shown to, to be very beneficial. And it's been shown to you know, avert some of these downstream you know, consequences of, of, of trauma. So uh, I would just stick with uh, Dr. Birmingham's wisdom. Okay, Doc. I'm gonna walk back home. <laughs> I'm gonna listen to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, listening is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> um, you know, if you rearrange the word of, of, of listening, you, you, you find silent. So one has to be mindful and wait because magic happens sometimes when we're silent. Sometimes kids don't speak, they act. So if they're angry or they're having belligerent outbursts or if they're breaking a toy, or if they're not sleeping or eating, they're speaking. We just have to know how to listen. And so listening is not as easy as it sounds, but that's what's necessary now. We need to listen and listen to those that really know, not just to those who think they know, right? And um, I, I, that's why I love the idea of thinking about basing our decisions on, on what we know as scientific and not just what we think, because sometimes we can be misguided and we end up flying we think we're flying right, but we're flying upside down. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, and I, you know, I can tell you that the, the more I listen to my daughter, the more I, she tells me, <laughs> which is so powerful because, and all my kids is, is if they know that you're being receptive, they're more likely to share with you information that you need to know. Um, when we, my wife and I have walked for a long time together. We had a dog that we had to put down this summer. It was really sad. And I would always ask my daughter to come for a walk with us. And, you know, early part of the pandemic, she would go to sleep late, wake up late, be in her room, you know, you know, social media. And she have, you know, towards the last couple of months, she started walking with us. And that to me is a success. Like um, she sees that, that we walk, she's like, okay, I'll come walk with you. And to have a, a teenager walk with her parents, I think that that's hope. For a lot of parents, that's a breakthrough. <laughs> Representative, what's your approach? So I, I think a couple of things I have to remind myself. Um, some of this is I've had to really spend time checking in or what are the traumas that, I'm, uh, that I have from growing up in poverty and, um, and how are they manifesting themselves right in this moment? And one of them is to remind myself that I can't take away all their pain. And what I've noticed for me is that when I see my kids suffering, I will be patient, empathetic, but then I'll get angry because then I'm angry that, and I'm realizing that they might think I'm angry with them, but I'm angry because I can't take away their pain. And, um, and so I've had to really just do a lot of deep breathing and try to really detach from their anger, which is really them telling me that they're scared, that they're feeling anxious and that they need to hear that they need to hear the truth from me um, in a way that just feels a lot more grounding and safer. So I, I will tell you, I'm sharing a lot. My kids are, you know, going to continue to just love how much I share about our lives uh, <laughs> or not. Um, but just to say that, you know, those are the things that I've had to really check in with. And um, one, because I'm not somebody who has to get up every day and go to a grocery store and work or to a Target or to a hospital, it actually has given me more patience to not be in a rush to get them out the door so I can get to work. And so it's giving me a little bit more capacity um, and breathing deeply, not personalizing their stress and trying to see it for what it is. Boy, there's three real different answers and uh, a lot to take away from each of them. I really appreciate the fact that, uh, that you answered them personally like that. Representative Marjorie Decker has represented, as I mentioned, parts of Cambridge in the Massachusetts legislature since 2013 and is also chair of the Mental Health Substance Abuse and Recovery Joint Committee. And we thank you, Representative, uh, thank you. And, and wish you luck in, in the efforts that you're making. Uh, Dr. Matthew Birmingham, I just love the way you spell your first name. I can only imagine the way people pronounce it because I know about that, the Medical Director of Children's Services of Roxbury. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for those great answers. And Dr. Philip Wong, uh, bringing the data and helping us understand a lot of the science here uh, in a way that we could actually, I think, absorb it and, and get something out of it. The Chief of Psychiatry at Cambridge Health Alliance, thanks to the three of you. Uh, as I mentioned, this program uh, will live online. So like it, share it if you like this kind of programming and it will of course be on the forums 
uh, website here, Children's Mental Health, How Science Informs Policy. Thank you so much to the three of you for being with us here at the GBH Forum. The Museum of Science and Hunger to Health Collaboratory invites you to a town hall presentation on Monday, the next one, Monday, October 5th at 5 p.m. as part of their annual Hunger to Health Summit. Lois Ellen Frank of Red Mesa Cuisine and Sean Sherman of the Sioux Chef will have a conversation on health equity and food security. It'll be moderated by Karen Holmes Ward, the Director of Public Affairs and Community Services at WCVB here in Boston. Two social impact leaders highlighting models and approaches that they have used to create food systems that support health outcomes in the face of persistent health disparities. This is a story that we've covered a lot at WGBH News, and it's one that we're gonna have a chance to really dig into uh, with some experts here in the forum. And again, that is Monday, October 5th at five. For more information and to register, you can find a link right here in our chat uh, on our uh, Zoom virtual studio. So thank you so much to all of you for all of your great questions, for your participation and for being with us for another smart talk here on the GBH Forum. My name is Joe Matthew. For our guests and our producer, Annie Schreffler, we'll see you next time on the radio.